Uh, welcome to week nine. Um, this is our last full week of content. Next week's a pretty light week of work. I don't even know if we'll use the full out four hours of lectures, but um, this is the last full week of content. So um, what we're going to get started with today is a topic on heaps, and then we're going to move on to hashing and then tries. So heaps are essentially the last, like heaps, hashing and tries are essentially three data structure topics. So most of what we're talking about today and this week are data structure topics. And then uh, that's it. So it's a lot of data structure this week. Um, I think these are three really interesting topics. Heaps and hashing are a little bit harder to understand than tries. Tries are a pretty straightforward topic. So we'll get started on heaps, which we'll definitely get through today. And then we'll probably make a start on hashing as my guess. So we'll see how we go. Again, this is the first time I've taught these topics. Now, why should you care about these topics? Here is my anecdotal advice to to you. Um, oh, okay. Well, my camera just disappeared again. That's strange. Um, so my anecdotal advice to you on this topic is that um, this topic, because it's at the end of the course, it has a kind of a terrible tendency, I think, to be like kind of easily forgotten. Um, and I can tell you this from personal experience, having been a student in a course like this, having then also taught a course like this on two or three separate occasions, I can't remember, um, is that this topic is just kind of always forgotten. And it sucks because the knowledge you take away from this topic is, is really important. Like understanding heaps are, is, is a little bit of a different data structure than the other things. It's not something you can necessarily just pick up instantly. Um, hashing is a really important idea that you'll understand at a high level really quickly, but it's important to think about the details of it as well. And the reason that it's easy to forget this topic or these topics this week is because it comes up and then it's in your exam and that's it, right? It's not part of any assignment. There's always going to be some content we teach that can't find its way into an assignment just by virtue of timing and trimesters and stuff. So, um, do your best to not only try and pay attention to this when you're revising for the exam, but actually take a personal interest in it because it, they are quite interesting topics. And I, I want to be clear, I cut, I cut things out of this course. I've probably cut, I don't know, 10% out of 2521 in terms of little details here and there because I really want to focus in always on like the details that matter. So, you know, don't feel like there's a whole bunch of stuff you shouldn't really care about. So firstly, heaps. Um, when we talk about heaps, I think the immediate thing you can easily get confused with is thinking that it has something to do with heap memory, which we've talked about a lot in this course. Heap memory, stack memory, that is a totally different concept. It has absolutely no correlation at all. Um, so, well, like, just, I don't want to sound too dramatic. It's just like, don't mix the two things in your head. This is not some extension or sibling of the heap memory stuff. This is about heap structures. Um, what is a heap structure? Well, heap's just a word to describe <clears throat> a collection of things. It's a pretty broad word. Um, but what heaps are and why we care about them is that heaps are tree-like structures that are stored in an array. And this allows us to have some really unique properties in terms of speeds of insertion and speeds of removal. And eventually, this is how you'll come to understand that priority queues, like how priority queues are implemented. So yeah, that's why we care about heaps. Now, um, with heaps, we can generalize heap structures um, as dense trees. Uh, sorry, we can conceptualize heap structures as dense trees. Now, what I, I want to emphasize here is that this is not what heaps look like in memory. Heaps are not trees. They are arrays, which we'll get to soon, but they can be conceptualized as trees. It's a little bit like, um, you know, you can conceptualize lots of things as trees. You could conceptualize a, a sorted array as a tree for binary search if you wanted to. Um, so this is just how we think about it. The important properties of a heap are that a tree maintains a general order where higher elements are closer to the root and lower elements are closer to the bottom. It doesn't maintain a strict order throughout the entire tree like a binary search tree does. But the two general rules that follows are that generally things toward the top are higher. Um, and also that um, 
it maintains that for any node, all the items on the left are larger and all the items on the right are smaller. And you can see, oh, not that's not quite true all the time, but like um, it tries to maintain something like that. Because you'll see here that like for Z here, you know, T is kind of bigger than it. S is kind of smaller than it. I'm um, sorry, S... S is smaller than T and, and so forth. I think I think this is kind of phrased poorly. I've rewritten a lot of these slides is like that um, generally speaking, there's kind of ordering on both sides of the tree, but there's no real sense of like um, the strictness that you see with binary trees where, you know, everything to the left is less than and everything to the right is greater than, you know, and that, that can kind of be applied for all nodes in the entire tree. So it has a much looser style of ordering, right? Um, Matthew says, what's a dense tree? A dense tree is a little bit like a B tree where, um, or like a two, three, four tree where you do, it's generally kind of, I don't want to say, I guess it's balanced, but you, you're not, you don't let things kind of get added down giant branches or whatever. And why, why we've got this diagram here with the numbers is that it's trying to show you that as this tree grows, it actually specifically grows in this order. Now, this isn't to say that when you insert these elements, they always end up exactly here. Like, it's not to say if I was inserting Z, T, S, D, K, they would go like, da, 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 da. It's more like as this tree grows, if a tree has one item, it's just got the root. When the second item's added, maybe there's some rearrangement, which we'll talk about later, but it's just these two, the third one's here. So it basically fills a tree in level order. Um, so the reason we call it a dense tree is because as you add more nodes to this tree, you might have to do some rearrangement, but there's going to be now like all of these nodes, all of these spots will be filled by nodes of some value. And then this one, and then this one, and then this one, and so forth, right? Um, so that's why we've said here, since they're dense trees, the depth of the tree is basically the log plus one. Because if you have three items, um, you know, the... The depth's going to be two. If you have seven items, the depth's going to be three. So it kind of grows out quite compact. Um, that's just another feature of it. When you add new items to the tree, you initially add them at the lowermost rightmost leaf. So if I was to add another item, it would get added here and then another item here. The important detail, though, is that's not necessarily where it stays, as we'll learn later. So when you add a new item, um, it ends up kind of down here, but then it drifts up to the top like that sometimes. But regardless of where these things are rearranged, it, it, all the nodes are in the same general place. Now, I said before that we can conceptualize uh, heaps like trees, but they're not actually trees. And more specifically, while something like a binary search tree we actually implement as a linked data structure, which we've been doing for weeks, heaps are often implemented as arrays. Um, and what we do is that we, it's essentially taking a tree structure and it's putting it in an array in level order. So you can see here on the left, I have a tree that has, you know, T, Q, K, M, A, H, like that, in those orders. And then we insert it into the array like this. Now, a couple of details you notice. One is that the zero is missing. Um, the reason for that will become apparent uh, later, I think. It'll become a bit more obvious, but we, we never put anything in the zeroth element here based on the general implementations. Um, and then as we insert them in this order, which makes sense, like just like reading left to right as if you were reading, you know, text, um, we get some unique properties, which is that if you're at index one here, like T, yeah, um, what happens is if you want to get the left child of that item, if you want to get to Q, you simply follow this rule where you take your index, which is one, and you multiply it by two. So then I get here, which is Q, right? So I is my index. I can find the left child of index I by multiplying it by two. And that gives me two I, which is two. So now I know it's Q. And if I want to find the left index of Q, then I can multiply that by two, two I, where I is two, and I get four. And then you can see these things correlate. And the same thing's true for the right child. So if I want to find the right child of Q, I do two I plus one, which gives me four plus one, which is five. And that, that's correct there. Um, and so forth. And you can find the parent by dividing any particular node by two. And remember that this is all integer um, arith arithmetic. So what happens then is that when you divide like a node by two, if it's like a three, for instance, here, which is a K, when you divide three by two, you get 1.5, which floors and you get one. So the parent of three is three on two, 1.5, floored to one, which is one. So all of the math here actually checks out um, pretty well. Now, 
one of the reasons that we I'll, I'll keep reiterating this later one of the reasons that we don't fill the zero is because um the the math kind of gets a bit weird here in terms of like if you had a root at zero you would have to redefine how a lot of this math works here because two times anything is zero and anything divided and any non-zero divided by another number is non-zero as well. So it's like, if you just thought about this mathematically, if you put your root here, you couldn't multiply it by 2i or 2i plus 1 because you'd always end up in kind of the same spot. Um, Andre says, could we negative 1 then halve the right child to get the parent? So the, the reason I described that before is like, we don't include anything in the zeroth element. Um, I, I kind of said that that's not possible based on our implementations. I've never tried it, but I'm pretty sure you could just do a different implementation with different maths, like you've kind of suggested, and you could fill that zero element. It's just that leaving one particular element blank is a negligible space cost, and it does simplify a lot of the logic in the implementation. Um, so yeah, I'm sure it's possible. I can't see why it wouldn't be. It's just a question of whether it's worth it. Uh, but that's how we store heaps. We store them in this particular structure here. So if you see a heap like this, you could actually take it and build a tree like that. Um, oh, sure. So Andre said, I meant like rather than floor, not the zero thing. Um, <clears throat> could we negative one, then take a half? Uh, yeah, I don't think so. 3 minus 1, because then when you get 2 minus 1, you'd get 1, and then when you halve that, you get 0.5, which, yeah, I, I don't think so, because if you minus it by 1, I think you're just shifting the um, the flooring to odd indexes instead of, to even indexes instead of odd. Um, yeah, so that that's a, that's a very high level look at heaps. If we go into some more detail about how this kind of thing is implemented, um, then the, da the data structures are, are relatively straightforward, I think, in, in my opinion. Um, the idea is that you have your heap rep. This is the same as a BS tree or a graph or anything else like that. It's just, this is your struct here, and you type def a pointer to a struct. Typically, you'd have this in your .h file. Okay, so typically that type def would be in your .h file. In this case, everything else here is part of our implementation. So it's not part of the ADT interface. It's part of the implementation of an ADT. And you can see that we've got three fairly expected items to store in our struct. First one's an array of items. Um, cool. Great. Uh, makes sense. I have to have an array of some sort. We know that an array looks like that. Uh, I need a number of items currently in the array because you know with any kind of array in C we need to keep track of how how many elements it's filled with. And then we have n slots which is the number of elements in the array. Maybe that's not extremely well worded but basically that is like what's the max size of the array? You know what's the max size of the heap? How many elements can we put in the heap? When we create a new heap we do what you'd expect. We, we malloc a new heap memory object um, we have to malloc the array as well. This is probably a concept I've seen a lot of people struggle to get their head around. S not a lot of people. I've seen some people really struggle to get their head around in assignment one is the idea that, you know, when you create these structures, it's, it's not just like one big malloc, but if you have a, sometimes you need to malloc a, a struct which contains other structs or it contains lists or something, you need to malloc those as well. Um, and then we set new items to be A, which is the, uh, that array that we've just initialized. There's currently nothing in it and it has a max size of N n was passed in when you created the heap. So because a heap is an array-like structure, it has a certain size that it can get to before it runs out of memory, um, just like any other array. So, you know, you pick a size too big, you waste some memory, you pick a size too small, you, you run the risk of either running out or potentially having to reallocate. Um, so yeah, that, that's the general gist of the structure. Probably... Probably the more um, kind of, I guess, difficult parts to understand about a heap are inserting and removing from a heap. So when it comes to inserting into a heap, it's a two-stage process. And the, the first one is the easy stage. The idea is that if you have a, a heap like this, um, and let's imagine that the red element's not here yet, right? So your heap just kind of like... 
Um, oops. Yeah, let's imagine that, you know, if we take this for a sec and then we open my favorite tool on the computer, MS Paint, um, like, let's imagine this is what the heap looks like and then we say I'd like to insert something into it. In particular, in this case, I'd like to insert Y into it. So, where do we put the Y? Well, the Y is going to go here. It's going to go in the next element because it's a dense tree. If I was to then insert another element, it would come over here and then the next one would come over here and then the next one would come over here, right? Like, it always follows this pattern, the rightmost and the bottommost um, one, like that. So, I insert it to the Y. That's the easy part. Now, the thing is that when you insert it into the Y, you might violate the heat property. Um, and the heat property, is, as we've kind of talked about before, is that as you go further up the heap, the item should be larger. Okay, so it's like as you approach the top, like the top should have the highest element and then it like goes down like that, um, such that, you know, T is greater than Q and K, M is great, M and A are greater than, sorry, T is greater than Q and K, Q is greater than M and A, K is greater than H and Y right? So that's the heat property that kind of has a sense of order. Um, as D. Aurora said, you're basically inserting at the end of the next free array spot. Uh, yes, that's true. So in terms of this array here, if you're always inserting at the end and the arrays in level order, then you are always essentially inserting it at the very end of the array, the next available spot at the end of the array. But you then have to do something um, which we call, sorry for that typo, we call fix up, which is reorganizing the values along the path to the root. So think of this a little bit like tree rebalancing, except I don't want to confuse it with tree rebalancing because tree rebalancing is a complex operation. Um, in terms of like you're rotating and stuff, it's actually really simple. You insert a new node and then you find the path between it and the root and you make sure that it's in the right spot and you just basically do a series of swaps think of it like a bubble sort even till it gets to the top so you can see here that because y is greater than k it's in the wrong spot so i'm going to swap it with k so now this is t y k but then y is still in the wrong spot because it's greater than y so i have to swap it again so essentially that that y k gets like swapped up twice like that um and then we end up with our Y at the top of the tree, uh, which is which is a nice, easy thing to do. That's not particularly hard. What, what would the time complexity of that be? Log N, right? Because for any given node, you just have to go up through its parents, which is like log N steps for N nodes in the array. Um, so that's, that's how we insert. And if you look at the code for that, um, the code is relatively straightforward as well in terms of if I have a heap and I want to insert an item T, then what I do is I increase the number of items in my array because I'm adding a new item. I add that new item to the end that's been inserted and then I call fix up on that item. I call fix up, uh, yeah. Um, and you can see that what fix up does is fix up, like takes in an index. So this is simple, like just adding to the end of the array. And then this one is saying, okay, well, let's look at the end of the array element and let's try and fix it up to make sure it's in the right spot. So we always add it to the end and then fix it up to the right spot. The fix up <coughs> function probably looks a little bit complex here. Like it's like, oh, what's happening there? But it actually makes a lot of sense because um, as we know from this structure here, because every parent is just a half index above, we can basically just keep applying this rule until we get to the root. Because like, let's say we insert a new value here at index seven, and maybe I can, maybe I can take a screenshot of this one here and insert something at index seven. Oh, that's, I don't know what I'm just dragging now, but that'll do. Um, yep. Yeah, so I grab this and I insert say Y at index seven. Okay. So that's easy. This comes down here now, but then I do fix up. And let's do it on the array instead of the tree, because I think we all hopefully get the tree one. But with the array, the logic you're going to follow is you're going to compare 7 to its parent. What's its parent? It's half 7, which is 3.5, which is 3. And then you're going to go, oh, is uh, you know 7 bigger than 3? Yeah, it is. So I need to swap that. I need to swap those things around. So I'm going to swap this around now. Great, and, and then we repeat the process and we say, all right, is Y3 
is that greater than its parent? Is it in the wrong spot? So we compare 3 divided by 1.5, which, di sorry, 3 divided by 2 is 1.5, which floors to 1. So then we get that there. And yeah, then we end up with this, like that. And done. And that's what the fix up operation is doing. It's literally looking at itself and the parent and it's just swapping that. And you can see this here if we look at the code. Um, is that we say while i is greater than 1, because obviously once we get to 1, as we move like up up that heap to the parent, we're like done. So while we're not at the root of the tree, and we can see that <coughs> the parent is less than me, swap my parent and me, and then ha then halve i to kind of move to the parent. So it is, it is uh, I mean, you know, you could probably implement this recursively too. I don't think there'd be any real issue with that. I think the the iterative one isn't that complex though, so it's not a big problem. Um, but that's the gist of what we're doing with fix up here, is that where we're just swapping things up to the top. Um, you can also see this happen here if we look, if we have a, a heap that looks like this, T, K, M, and B, another dense tree, and then we add an X, the X gets added to the end of the array, slot, slot 5. We, we find the parent of slot 5, if it's in the wrong spot we swap it. And then similarly here, if it's in the wrong spot, we swap it. So we did two swaps here, and you can see it move up the tree and swap with elements here. So the way that a heap works is that the inserting carries a little bit of load. It's a little bit like some of those self-balancing trees. You know, insertion isn't just as simple as adding it to the end. Um, you kind of have to uh, do a little bit of cleanup as you go. Are there any questions on this so far? Give you 10 seconds to let me know. Ah, uh, but T is greater than M. How does that work? Well, I mean, so the heap property, and again, I'll, I'll go fix this up on one of the earlier slides because I think it was written wrong, is um, the heap property is that parents are bigger than their immediate children. Um, right? That's that's kind of the, the most basic rule. Um, so X needs to be bigger than T and M. T needs to be bigger than B and K. That's really what matters here. Um, that's pretty much it. As long as that's maintained, then... Um, then you'll be fine. Um, Matthew says, so this is a way to keep memory contiguous. I don't get why we're bothering with this structure. Ah, well, you'll soon find out why we're bothering with this structure. Well, I mean, the, the, the sh there's a few reasons we might bother with this, but the short answer is that this is how we implement a priority queue. So if you found a priority queue useful so far, then, you know, um, that's just, this is how we implement it. So to actually implement the priority queue, we we need to have a structure like this. There's probably other ways to do it, but this is a very efficient way to do it. And I think that'll, that'll be clear at the end. Um, in terms of heap deletion, this one is a little bit more, um, I guess, roundabout. It's not, it's not that complex. It's a little bit harder than fix up though. When we delete from a heap, we always delete the root. Always delete the root. There is no like delete specific node function or anything like that. It's like delete means delete root. It's like having a stack or a queue and popping off the top or the front or whatever. Um, and when we delete, we follow a three-step process. Firstly, we replace the root um, by the bottom most rightmost value. So in a tree like this one here, um, just trying to make sure that yeah, so it, oh, I think I've have I missed a slide here. Does it continue from okay? I think I think I can I, I'll think I'm just missed some context here. But if we look at heap deleting, right? So imagine this is the tree that we start with up here. I think I should have just included this on the slide because it's not obvious that's linking from before. And then let's say we do a heap deletion on this tree. If we do a heap deletion on this tree, we're gonna be removing the node T. Right, because it's at the root. Now, the first thing we do is we swap the root with the very bottom right, rightmost node. So the T and the H get swapped here. And then the H gets moved up to the root. Right? 
um, and then we delete the t. So that's really easy. So it's like you replace the root with the bottommost right hand value. So the t and the h get swapped like I have here. And then you delete like because this one is now t and then this one is now h. You delete the, that's the step two is you delete the bottom right most one. So you've gotten rid of the root. Okay, you swap it with the bottom right, you delete it. The tree structure stays intact. Um, in terms of like you've essentially now, like you've essentially moved the element to the very end of the array and then deleted it. So it's still like all contiguous, everything's good. But the problem is, is now your heat property might be violated. Um, now your H is not necessarily bigger than Q and K. So the ordering of this tree does not make sense. So you need to reorganize the values along that path from the root to restore the heap. And to do this, you use a fix down function, which is the exact same thing as fix up, except it does it in the other order. So it, you know, looks here and it looks at the child and it says, if I'm smaller than the child, I'm going to swap myself with it. And then it does that the whole way down. Now, if we look at the code for this, again, the heap delete is not, um, you know, super complicated in terms of we grab the root of our heap we then assign the root to be the very last element in our heap, which is essentially getting rid of the root because, you know, we're not really swapping and deleting. It's kind of, we're like assigning over the top of it, which erases it. And then we decrease the number of items in our heap. So now we've removed the root, um, maintained a structure, but the heap property has been violated. So we have to fix down, which is moving it um, uh, down one of the sides. And then you can see here, the fix down function is, is a little bit of arithmetic again, but um, it follows a general principle of like, we start at the root and then we simply say, um, while two times i is less or equal to n, that's basically saying, while, um, while, I'm, while I'm not a leaf, like while I'm not at the leaf node yet, we move down the tree, we times it by two to kind of get the left child um, and then here we do some funny little checks where we basically check if like, um, uh, you know, we have two children, right? Each node has two children. And we have to figure out, are we going to um, compare it with the left child or the right child, right? Um, and we essentially choose a correct value for J and then we swap it. And again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and like step through this entire code bit by bit because you can obviously look at it but the logic of it is relatively like even though even though the logic of it is maybe not super clear just looking at the code um you should be able to so i'm just trying to get to the previous thing i have slippery fingers So once you rearrange your heap structure like this and you say, well, I need to move this H down, essentially what you're doing now is the same kind of process as before where you're grabbing the H, you're checking either children and you're saying, you know, is it, is it which ones it's smaller than in this case? And I move that there and then my H is here and then I check, okay, is my H um, uh, bigger than both of these? Like, no, it's not. So this ends up getting swapped with the M down here like that. And now our heap property is maintained. So that's what a fix down does it is it moves it down um, from the root to the relevant spot and it um, in this case here it chooses the larger of the two children um, yeah there's a few different implementations of this but it's all it's all relatively the same you'll often see a lot of like two times i's and divided by twos when you do this stuff because you could imagine going down through a heap object as kind of multiplying it by two, maybe adding one or not, but it's always like multiply by two, multiply by two and repeat, and then going up a heap towards the parents, like dividing by two. So that's deletion. So it's just, it's just insert and deletion. And I think a really interesting thing about a heap that's unique to it is that both heap insertion and heap deletion um, do some modification to the heap potentially. So both insert and delete do little bits of modification, which means they both carry a cost, even though it's a relatively small cost compared to some other things. Now, let's look at the complexity of heap insertion and heap deletion, <coughs> uh, which is interesting, which is that to insert into a heap, we have to add a new item at the end of the array, which is 01, and then we have to move an item up to the correct position, which is worst case log n. For deletion in a heap, we have to 
replace the root by the item at the end of the array, which is 01, which, and we delete that item. And then we have to move the new root down into its correct position. So inserting is slapping at the end, moving it up to the right position. Deleting is removing the root, grabbing the bottom, putting it up at the root, and then moving it down to the right position. And both of those are log n, which makes sense because inserting and deleting only up and down the a path of a tree is only going to be log n steps of work. So inserting and deleting into this data structure are only log n. Now, the reason this is interesting for us is because the structure that we have essentially created here is a structure that says for a <clears throat> log n insertion cost and a log n pop cost, because deleting is basically pop, <clears throat> I can give you a data structure where I'll always have the biggest element at the front for you, the highest element. Or the lowest. It doesn't really like either. Either is fine. We're just using highest as an example, and that's actually exactly what a priority queue is. Because a priority queue is a structure where it acts like a queue, where you you insert it, and you always want to pull out the most relevant element, which in a standard queue is the the least recently added element. Um, but a priority queue is always sorting by key. So a priority queue is basically a queue, except when you insert numbers, they get sorted, um, such that when you pull them out. Uh, you get them in the right spot. Now, if you were to just conceptualize a priority queue and not think about the implementation, you could think about it pretty easily. Like if I was to try and insert numbers into the priority queue, like if I was to insert like a, a three and then like a five, like let's say I want to insert three, five, two, one, six, four, like that. Um, so I insert a three and then I insert a five and then I insert a two and then I insert a one and then I insert a six. I don't know where my one went. And then I insert a four. Well, that's like what a priority queue does so that when you then pull out from the front and you pull that one out and pull that one out, it's actually all in order. Now, that's not literally how a priority queue works. That's just a way of conceptualizing it because a real priority queue is built with a heap in this case, um, which stores things a little bit more roundabout than this, but it gives you the same behavior. We can use a heap for a priority queue but if we wanted to. We could create a priority queue type def called PQ, which we can have as just a heap. And then we can create a join function for the priority queue as in like push or add or append. Um, so we want to take this priority queue and add something to it. And then we could have like a pop or a leave priority queue thing where we always get the highest element where we give it a priority queue and it returns an item. And these two functions could just be some simple abstractions of a heap implementation that we have, right? So like a priority queue add is just a heap insert and a priority queue delete is just a heap um, remove, heap delete. So a heap is actually kind of, you could think of a heap as like literally a priority queue implementation, maybe just with a different name. Um, yeah. So the question from NASA, when moving down and it is smaller than both sides, um, how would we know if it will go left or right? Well, I mean, I would honestly just encourage you to take the time if you're curious about that to go and actually plug in some values, like make a little heap yourself, plug in some values here, have a look at this logic write down some examples, like follow the flow through it. Um, and, and you know, you'll be, you'll be able to see how this particular implementation actually like makes decisions as in which side, under what conditions it'll go through. Um, and Matthew says, can you explain why it's called a heap? No, I don't really know why a graph's called a graph. I don't really know why, a, uh, most of the other ones make sense. I'm sure there's a read. I don't know why graph's called a graph. I mean, it's just what I was told it was called, and it make I remember that. So, I don't know we, why we call lots of things. I don't. Know. Yeah. So, good question though. So, if this is our priority queue, which is basically a simple wrap around a heap. Um, yeah, Trent says it's because it's a heap of fun. That makes sense. Then, um, what's interesting about a heap is that oh, sorry, a priority queue is that you could implement a priority queue with. Um, any kind of data structure, right? Like if I just said to you, build a priority queue for me with an array or a linked list, you could probably do it, right? Like you could probably get a linked list and every time you insert a value is like put it in the right spot, you know, like put it in the right order. And then every time you pull, just take the front off. You could probably do it with an array with a lot of reshifting. But you see, the thing is when we look at a priority queue implementation with different structures, like an array, you can see that they all have costs, right? Like an array has massive cost for priority queue because for like a sorted array, which it kind of needs to be, um, because to 
To add something to the array, you potentially have to reshift everything. To pull off the front of the array, you probably have to reshift everything. When it comes to a list, a sorted list, to insert into the list, you potentially have to iterate through every element to find the right spot. To pull off the list, it's pretty easy because you can just pop the front off because lists are really easy to like remove the front and the end. Um, so lists and arrays aren't great for priority queues because you at least have one of the operations is probably going to be on, which isn't too great. Um, but a heap has the advantage of having both join and leave being log n. Now you might be thinking, oh, well, sure, they're both log n, but at least a list has an O1 and it's like it's true but if you think about a heap structure if you have a if you have a, a structure with a million elements in it having something that's constant time and then taking a million steps in the case of a list so it's constant to leave a million to join is worse than a heap which say takes log of a million to join and log of a million to leave and as we know like log two of a million I think that's a million Log two of a million is 20. So it's like 20 is a lot better than a million. And substantially better than a million, right? So the heap is absolutely quicker under most conditions because it has this log n insert um, and a log n uh, leave. Uh, so Matthew then says, is a, so is a priority queue just a disguised stack? Um, no, I, I don't really think it's a disguised stack. A priority queue is a, he, is a, is a queue Except when you insert an element, it doesn't it doesn't go to the back. It essentially goes to a sorted spot. So you can think of it like a queue in terms of leaving a queue. Um, it's just that on the insert, you're not just adding to the end. You are adding it to the, the right spot to maintain some kind of sorted-ish order. So... the So that that's why we like heaps. Because they're very efficient at... Um, priority queues and stuff like that. And that makes sense because if you think about the way the structure works is that, you know, you look at these letters here, X, T, M, B, K. Now, obviously, K comes before B, right? So if you pop off X, like, and let me show you. So, like, I think the biggest conceptual hurdle to deal with when it comes to, to heaps is that just because heaps, like, heaps don't look sorted, right? You look here and you're like, okay, X is here, but like, I don't like this doesn't look sorted to me. And that's true. Like if it was a truly sorted structure, then removing from a heap would be constant time. Um, but it's not because you have to do a little bit of work to maintain it. So that's why you have to think of a heap as it's generally ordered. It's generally ordered such that parents are greater than their children. Because what happens is when I try and pop off this priority queue, I'm going to get my X. So there's my X. I popped it off. And what do we do? We pick up our K, we move it up here. Great. And then we have to do a fix down to say, well, if K is smaller than T or B, I have to swap it. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to swap T and I'm going to swap K. And then someone says, I need something else off my priority queue. So I call the delete again, the pop again. I get my T. And then we move the bottom rightmost thing up to the root. And then we move it um, left or right. Like in this case, should we move it left or right? You know? Someone, someone tell me, which way should it go? I, I know we got to wait for the lag, but um, we can actually go back and like reflect on our heap deletion thing here, um, where if you were to step through these kinds of algorithms and have a look at like which one it chooses, it's going to have to choose the one that is larger, right? So, out of K and M, which one comes later in the alphabet? M, right? Because M comes... Yeah, M. So, what ends up happening here is that when we've just moved B to the root, so this is halfway through a deletion now, we have to do a fix down. We're going to have to swap that with the M. Like that. So, this is the fix down operation. Such that then the next time someone says heap delete and they pop off the top, I take my M up here, I move the bottom most, rightmost node to the top, and then I fix it down, which in this case means it does get swapped with the K, like that. And then next time I get a pop, I move the take the K off, like that. And then the B gets moved to the top and there's nothing to fix down, and then when you take B out of it, it, it comes up like this. So while the tree itself might not have a kind of looked ordered to your brain, 
um, when you actually take things out because of the way that the fix down is kind of constantly readjusting things, you actually get these in order you want like that. And each of those pops was theoretically log n time, um, which is pretty reasonable. So we talked about priority queues. Um, the last little comment to make is heap sort. I mentioned to you last week that we were going to talk about heap sort this week. Heap sort is a really interesting sort because um, it's another fast sort. Uh, it's an o it's an n log n sort, and the reason it's an n log n sort is because if you think about um, if you think about how a heap works, we know that you can insert into it any order and it will reorganize it but when you pull out of a heap when you pop off the heap you get everything in order which is basically sorting right like if you think about it a priority queue is essentially a sorting buffer you can insert elements into it and start taking things out of it and it's kind of like doing an ongoing sort of things so we can actually do a heap sort which i don't even have code for this because it's so simple which is as simple as like you get a heap you take a bunch of unsorted numbers you put them in the heap and then you pop everything out of the heap and you'll get them in sorted. You get them all sorted. And the complexity of this actually makes a lot of sense because if you look at how to insert those numbers into a heap, if you have n numbers and each number potentially has a worst case fix up, the cost of inserting those numbers into the heap is going to be n log n because you've got n numbers doing a log n operation. And then when you pull them out of the heap, um, it's going to be n more iterations except each fixed down is potentially log n so pulling them out of the heap is n log n so your overall time complexity is 2n log n but again because we ignore coefficients with time complexity it's just n log n so heap sort is actually another um, n log n search n log n sort um, which is definitely very cool uh, one of the downsides of, of this heap sort is like merge sort as well which is guaranteed to be n log n um, it is. It requires extra memory um, because you have to create the heap. So it's a little bit like merge sort in that you actually have a memory requirement that is n. So the space complexity of heap sort is like the space complexity of merge sort, which is O n. Um, I've never used a heap sort personally as like a preference to sort something, though I think one obvious example of it is that it's a guaranteed n log n worst case sort that can be implemented non-recursively pretty easily which i guess is a good sign because as we've said before um merge sorts can i don't even know can you do merge sort iteratively i don't know i know quick sort iteratively i wonder what a merge sort looks like oh that looks scary um yeah, I mean, you can do merge sort iteratively. It just makes me want to cry a little bit. So that's one of the benefits of heap is they're a pretty simple iterative structure that can be used to sort things. Um, yeah, any other questions on this? Because that's pretty much the end of this. We'll take a very slightly early break for 10 minutes and then we'll keep going to the next topic. But yeah, any questions about heaps before we before we move on? Uh, surely you could implement a heap in place without malloc. I don't know what you mean by implement a heap in place. Like, the point is a heap is just a structure, like an array linked list. Like, it, it, the, heap, the heap just takes whatever space it needs. The point is that a heap sort requires a heap to be sorted. So, like, if you have a list over here that's unsorted and you want to turn it into a sorted list, a heap sort... Um, I, d I think you. I think you can't do it in place. Yeah, I think you'd need more memory because the the way the algorithm works, you'd need a way to kind of build the structure out. Um, I don't think it's possible. I'd be happily proved wrong there, but y yeah, you just do need an actual separate data structure. Anyway, um, please leave feedback as always, and let's take a ten minute break and get into hashing.
So we'll start up around 3.03. Sounds good. <laughs>